Throughout the conflict in Ukraine, significant territorial shifts have occurred. Russia at one point advanced close to major urban centers, occupying farmlands and strategic rural areas. While their military presence has since diminished, they have left a lasting and destructive legacy on Ukrainian soil. Landmines. A cruel and long-lasting weapon designed to act as a deterrent for military personnel moving in to recapture land taken from them. However, once the positions are abandoned, the mines stay. Concealed underground, they continue to pose significant threats for years or decades after the conflict's conclusion, hindering agricultural activities, restricting civilian mobility, and causing lasting trauma. Starting in 2014, with the Russian occupation of Crimea, the south of Ukraine became contaminated with minefields. Seven years of tedious work went into demining an area of 23,000 square kilometers. In 18 months, all that work went to waste. As this area, plus another 150,000 square kilometers, is now contaminated with mines once again. This accounts for 30% of Ukraine's total land area, roughly the size of Florida, making Ukraine the country with the largest area contaminated by mines. The regions affected are concentrated in the east, where most of the conflict is happening, but also include areas near the country's capital, where the Russian army got worryingly close in 2022. These mines are already starting to take a toll on the Ukrainian people, as 298 civilians have been killed, 22 of them being children, with over 600 injured. Unfortunately, these numbers are only going to grow. It is estimated that it will take Ukraine 750 years to clear its land using current demining and detection techniques. So what exactly are landmines and what tools do we have to detect and destroy them? Let's delve deeper into the painful task facing Ukraine. There are two types of landmines. Larger ones that are designed to disable or destroy large vehicles like tanks and smaller ones designed to maim individuals. And Ukraine is unfortunately littered with both. The Russian PFM-1 is a small plastic case mine filled with 37 grams of liquid explosives. Nicknamed the butterfly mine, their small wings allow them to be dropped from the air, whether by mortar, helicopter, or airplane. The unsymmetrical wings allow them to glide and spin to the ground like a helicopter seat, landing softly on the ground, waiting for an unsuspecting victim. When stood on, the thin plastic deforms, which increases the pressure on the liquid inside the casing, causing it to explode. Because they are camouflaged and contain little metal, detection of these sinister weapons is extremely challenging. Their lightweight nature allows them to be carried by water, potentially reaching civilian areas where children can mistake them for toys, making them particularly inhuman. The Russian PMN-2 landmine is a general purpose mine that also uses a plastic casing to minimize metal components. It is buried between five to 10 centimeters below the surface and contains around 100 grams of TNT. It detonates with a weight of only 15 kilograms, low enough to be triggered by stepping on it. But mines aren't only activated by pressure. To create impediments along roads or entrances to buildings, the OZM-72 landmine uses a tripwire as a trigger to explode 660 grams of TNT. Anti-tank mines, unlike those targeting individuals, require more TNT to penetrate heavily armored tanks and are designed to detonate under larger pressures. The M1 Abrams tanks recently sent to Ukraine will face the TM-62 landmine which detonate only when objects weighing over 150 kilograms pass over them, delivering a powerful 7.5 kilogram TNT explosion. Since 2021, the Russian army has employed the PTKM-1R, a novel mine designed to target the upper and less armored sections of the tank. The mine is not triggered by passing over it. Instead, it is equipped with two seismic sensors for the detection of tank movement and four microphones to capture loud sounds. Once a tank is detected, it tilts 60 degrees towards the target and launches a munition 30 meters above the tank. In a parabolic trajectory, infrared and radar sensors activate the second explosive phase, deploying a shaped charge to penetrate the tank from above. Tools to help detect and destroy these mines have come mostly from the US. Anti-mine equipment is listed as part of the latest $600 million package to Ukraine in September 2023, so what do these tools look like? 
the tools chosen to demine an area depend on the current phase of the conflict and the land's intended use after the mine has been removed. Military demining intended to establish secure pathways for highly trained soldiers and heavily reinforced equipment is carried out very differently from demining efforts in civilian areas used for farming or where children will play freely. So how does the military deal with these mines? With brute force. Mine clearance line charges can create a secure path in minutes. These are long lines containing C4 explosive pellets attached to a central nylon rope along with detonation wires. The line is attached to a solid propellant rocket placed on an angled guide. When fired, it pulls the 100 meter line taut along the desired path, then the line is detonated. The explosion creates enough pressure to detonate any mines below the surface and four meters to each side of the line. If a longer path is needed, the machine will roll along the recently created path and repeat the process. This method prioritizes speed for when enemies are nearby or troops need to move quickly to the front lines. But this method comes at a high cost. Each line costs $83,000. But what if speed is not as important, like when the enemy has retreated and you need to secure key positions? In some cases, fields have been set on fire in Ukraine to clear them of the small plastic PFM-1 mine. Armored tanks resistant to smaller mine explosions outfitted with tools to either detonate or push aside mines can also be used. One method uses chain-linked flails. As the vehicle moves forward, these flails strike and detonate the mines. This often breaks the flail, causing chain links to fly off into the distance, but additional links can easily be attached to repair them. Detonation may not always be necessary to clear a path. A plow attachment on the M1 Abrams tank can dig into the soil beneath the mines and push them aside out of the way without triggering them from above. In recent years, smaller remote controlled flailed vehicles have started to operate too. Ukrainian farmers desperate to start cultivating again have even retrofitted some of their farming equipment to be remote controlled and have started to unofficially demine their lands. Using armored vehicles like these for mine clearing does have some limitations. They are unsuitable for rough terrain and dense vegetation, where maneuverability is compromised. In open areas such as those in Ukraine, they can also become a conspicuous target that the enemy can anticipate. Ukrainian soldiers have reported that the Leopard tank is particularly vulnerable when engaged in minefield clearance. It is frequently targeted by the Russian army since disabling the tank will significantly impede the Ukrainian forces progress. These methods can remove 80 to 90% of mines. Mines that do not detonate either become further buried or remain alongside the cleared path. Within military standards, this level of effectiveness is considered acceptable as soldiers are trained to spot mines on the ground and can more easily navigate and avoid them. The last 10 to 20% of mines are the ones that stay in the ground. Or if a military operation does not pass through a contaminated area, the mines stay there until a civilian gets injured. Removing these mines is known as humanitarian demining. Ukraine is not the first country to be scattered with mines in civilian areas. Cambodia was infested with landmines during the Khmer Rouge regime. Three decades later, only half of the land has been cleared and they have already claimed the lives of 64,000 people. Even highly trafficked tourist regions like Siem Reap have ominous mine warning signs. A constant reminder not to venture off the beaten paths surrounding Cambodia's ancient temples. And the devastation these mines have had on the civilian population is a confronting reminder to tourists of the very recent genocide the country endured. In Afghanistan, landmines were indiscriminately laid during the Soviet occupation between 1979 and 1992 and continue to be laid by the Taliban today. This has injured or killed almost 57,000 people in the country. In 2021, 79% of the casualties were children. A small town in Mozambique was evacuated due to rumors of mines in the surrounding area. Three months later, only four were found. The power of landmines not only come from their instant destructive capabilities, but also their ability to scare people away. These are inhumane weapons that disproportionately kill and maim innocent civilians long after the conflict is resolved. In early 2022, a dam near Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine was destroyed. The estimated 500 mines in the area that were not properly removed or destroyed by the military have now potentially been dispersed by the floods. 
they may be buried deeper under debris or end up in entirely new locations. Uncleared mines are a major humanitarian challenge, especially as the UN standard requires 100% clearance rate within designated zones. Of course, to prevent harm from these mines, the first step is to cease their use entirely. The Ottawa Treaty, also known as the Mine Ban Treaty, prohibits the use, production, stockpiling and transfer of smaller anti-personnel mines, excluding those targeting tanks. The Ottawa Treaty has been widely embraced by the international community, with over 160 signatory countries. Unsurprisingly, it excludes Russia, the US, China, India and Pakistan, the world's largest military forces. The US reserved the right to use so-called non-persistent landmines, which self-destruct or self-deactivate after 30 days to reduce the risk to civilians. The rationale behind this policy was to support the defense of South Korea, where landmines play a significant role as a deterrent against potential aggression from North Korea. Russia told the UN in 2020 that it supports the world without mines, but they still see them as an essential tool to ensure border security. When not on the front line, the method for locating these mines primarily involves the use of metal detectors. Metal detectors are a simple tool. Any metal in the soil interacts with this detector and causes an audible beep for the user. The user's sole source of information is the strength of this beep, which communicates the size and proximity of the object. Consequently, operators must undergo rigorous training to interpret the auditory cues. Upon hearing a beep, deminers move to investigate the alarm. The most common way to do this is using a small stick. At an angle, to avoid the top of the mine, they poke the area in search of something solid. The probe can be anything from a screwdriver to more sensitive force measuring probing sticks that help assess the hardness of buried metal, allowing for the differentiation of shrapnel from potential landmines. This is a slow and tedious process that just adds stress to the already pressured deminers. Here lies the problem with using these simple tools. They detect any sort of metal in the ground. It can be either a mine or some shrapnel. In war-torn areas where shrapnel is common, soldiers looking for mines get false alarms between 100 to 1000 times for every mine they discover. To develop more advanced demining systems, the US Army initiated a substantial investment in 1992, allocating a total of $73 million over a 15-year period. The objective was to establish the gold standard in demining technologies, resulting in the handheld standoff mine detection system in 2006. The system uses two sensors, combining a metal detector with a ground penetrating radar. The radar gives the operator a better idea of the size, geometry and depth of the detected object, allowing them to filter out false positives that metal detectors frequently provide. Since its introduction, it's been used in Cambodia, Thailand, Afghanistan and Croatia to find 56,000 mines and reject 33 million false signals. Alternatively, we can detect mines through their smell. Dogs have been successfully trained to identify mines, including the famous Jack Russell Terrier of the Ukraine war who has helped detect hundreds of explosives. Small dogs are ideal for the job as they are too light to trigger mines. Rats are useful for the same reason. Off-the-shelf drones can also detect signs of mines that have been buried and in situations where landmines are placed directly on the ground or dispersed from the air like the PFM-1, drones can simply go up and spot them from above. However, efforts are being made to develop machine vision algorithms with both visible and infrared spectrums to detect these landmines automatically, and they could potentially be fitted with projectiles to target the mine from the air. Landmines will continue to plague Ukraine for the coming decades even if the war ends now. Hopefully, these new techniques and technologies can accelerate the clearance of this new, colossal minefield. But Ukraine also needs additional resources to clear the way for their advancing soldiers. So, to play our part, we'll be donating $2,000 to the Halo Trust, an NGO dedicated to clearing minefields around the world, including Ukraine, while campaigning for the banning of mines altogether. That money will be coming directly out of our sponsor fee for Nebula, and for every one of you that signs up to Nebula with the link in the description, we will donate another dollar to the cause. It costs just $2.50 to sign up to Nebula for a month, so that's 40% of your monthly fee going directly to charity. And you will get access to all the amazing content on Nebula too, including the next episode of Real Engineering, which won't be on YouTube for another two weeks. 
It details the incredible engineering of the F-16, diving into energy maneuverability diagrams and what makes the F-16 a formidable tool for the Ukrainian Air Force four decades after its first flight, with an interview from an experienced test pilot and former F-16 pilot David Kern. You can get access to that right now with the huge discounted price of just $2.50 a month using the link in the description. But early access to our videos is just one benefit. You will also get access to our original World War II series, The Logistics of D-Day and The Battle of Britain, as well as Real Life Lore's Modern Conflict series that deep dives into conflicts like the war in Ukraine, along with originals from some of your favourite creators, like Mustard, Practical Engineering, Neo and Wendover Productions. Nebula is simply the best place to watch our videos. No ads, early access to our videos and exclusive high-budget originals, all for the price of $2.50 a month.